Hello, I'm Emma Goswell, and welcome to FN Hormones, the podcast about perimenopause and beyond. Now, this is our first episode of 2022. And if you've had a break, I really hope you've had a good one and you've actually been able to see your family and friends. I know a lot of people haven't been lucky enough to do that. In this episode, you're going to hear all about how to get yourself on track if you've indulged in a bit too much over Christmas. Who doesn't, eh? Did you know that paying attention to your hormones can have a huge impact on how you exercise? Well, Jen Brooks knows all about that. She's a personal trainer that works with women in midlife to train around their monthly cycle. And if, like me, you don't really have a cycle anymore, uh, she's got an answer for that too. Now, we spoke to Jem a while before Christmas, and you will hear Terry in that interview. Terry can't be here right now, I'm afraid, but let's have a catch up with the rest of the gang. Not spoken since last year, Helen and Bina. Woo, 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 Welcome woo. back. Hello. Hello, hello. How the devil are you? Doing okay. All you know, fla- flailing around at the start of January, which I think we all kind of do a bit, and just going, oh my God. Did I actually really do this with my routine? How did I get up and do all this stuff before I even start work? What? That's that's basically where my brain is at right now. It's that sort of whirlwind time post-Christmas, isn't it? Where you go, oh, I've got to now know what day of the week it is and remember <laughs> what, I do, what I do for a living. It's tough, isn't it? Damn it. It's tough. What about you, Bina? <laughs> Well, I've just, before we started recording, just tested negative twice, a second time today. Uh, so I've had COVID. But yeah, no, so I'm I'm buoyed by the fact that literally, as of 10 minutes ago, I am free and COVID free, most importantly. Yeah, it's been an interesting week or two, I have to say. Um, are you allowed out in the world and finished I am isolation? allowed out. I am allowed out. I'm going to go running naked down the street after we've recorded this. So <laughs> I was going to say, I mean... thanks very much for recording this right now, rather than just like literally bursting out your front door and going, I'm free again. Freedom. <laughs> yeah. But, Listen, um, Bina, you oh, don't even get the hot flushes, so you won't get the benefit of running around naked in January. <laughs> no, this is true. It's like minus five outside. It's so cold, isn't it, today? Um, but I was uh, I was reading earlier, actually. There was a thing that's come out about long COVID. So I just thought this would be quite interesting just as we kick off, mm. I saw this thing which says, you know, basically there are 1.3 million people in the UK self-reported as having long COVID in early December. And this is figures compiled by the ONS, the Office of National mm-hmm. Statistics. And interestingly, it's most frequent if you are female, aged 35 to 69, oh. from a, a more deprived area, work in health, social care or education have an activity limiting condition or disability. And it says symptoms may vary, uh, but it can include extreme tiredness, shortness of breath and difficulty concentrating. Mm. And I just thought those symptoms are interesting, particularly given the age group of women that it seems to be particularly affecting. 35 Um, to 69, did you say? 35 to 69, but Mm. you know, extreme tiredness, difficulty concentrating. And I'm I just wouldn't, I don't know. I've well, we've heard of those got before, my brain haven't going. we? Yeah, we have, but I just, it obviously just got my brain, you know, worrying about uh, are our hormones playing into the fact that, you know, we might, as this particular age group of women. Because I've actually, uh, from what I've read, it was actually the opposite that women, well, particularly women on HRT, uh, and there's been no official studies into this yet or anything like that, but it seems to be so far reported that actually women on HRT call were doing better on, on the COVID side of things. So, really? yeah, yeah. There was something that um, Kate Muir, who's actually our guest in a couple of weeks' time, wrote an article about a while ago, actually. Yeah. yeah that's interesting. Mm, mm, Fascinating, mm. because you wouldn't want to get, you know, those symptoms you just mentioned, on top of the menopause, you know, double no. tiredness, double no. confusion. You know. Crikey, can you imagine? My God. It would be horrendous. If you weren't on HLT, it could be mm. you know, double whammy for people, couldn't it, really? It could be really difficult. Mm. Yeah. Oh, it'd be interesting to see how these um, how these things play out and how, how these, you know, because I think it's going to be a long while before we have any accurate figures mm. on anything, mm. no matter what it is right now. Everything's in... You know, it's crazy disarray at the moment, unfortunately, and the NHS is absolutely being pounded. Mm. Um, And so I think everyone just needs to, you know, I I guess everyone just needs to keep their head above water best they can, really. Totally. Totally. We'll call this out later. And talking of HRT, does anyone want an update on my HRT journey? Always. I was going to ask, yeah, how's it going? (laughs) 
I've been double pumping in the evening and Woo. single pumping in the morning. Um, and that, so, seems to be, so and that seems to be working for euphemism me. Euphemism there? No. <laughs> Sorry. No, I'm, on, I'm on the cream, aren't I, of estrogen, progesterone and testosterone. And I have to say, you know, I just think in the last few months I've turned a massive corner and I cannot even tell you right now where my fan is. I have maybe had the odd hot flush, but it's not like those sort of hot flushes where I'd have to rip my clothes off and my face turn the colour of beetroot, which you guys have witnessed on these Mm. uh, sort of (laughs) Zoom calls before. I've just sort of got through it. It's not been anywhere near as bad as it was. I would say 100% has changed my life. And I haven't had any of the mad sort of panicky emotional ups and downs that I had before the sort of just crying going I can't bear living like this anymore it's just gone yeah that's so great it just seems to be working it really does seem to be working and as you know that I am now a menopausal influencer I've put this on Twitter now (laughs) I I saw that you put that on your bio get you (laughs) like it I invited to talk on a conference about the menopause. So I figured if I did it once, I'm now a menopausal influencer. Yeah. Anyway, my role as a menopausal influencer, um, literally an hour ago before we sat down to chat and have our catch up, a friend of mine rang and went, Emma, I am at breaking point. Give me the name of your lady that gets wow. you HRT now. I have had it up to here with my doctor and she's had to put in an official complaint against oh, her doctor. No. She's been told, oh, forget it, you're not having it, there's nothing wrong with you, just get on with life, basically. And she is not having it. But this is the lady that uh, I think told you about this before, Helen. Get this, because we've been talking about testosterone since last series when we sp- spoke to Colette, didn't we, who was telling us about how she got... HRT over the counter in Barcelona mm-hmm. and she was having testosterone as well as um, the mm. other stuff that she was taking and how it really had improved her life and my friend wants exactly that you will not believe this her doctor turned around and went why do you want testosterone are you trans <gasps> oh my I god know. I know and had wow. absolutely no understanding and just and then just said so what if your sex drive's gone off a cliff? You're 51, that's what happens. <gasps> wow. Are you... No. Sorry, I'm just going to say, are you fucking joking? No, you Sorry. Can't that's swear. me. I good can God. swear. Yes, it's effing hormones. Yeah, of it's, course you can it's swear. It's a good it, God. It's a fucking joke, isn't it? Absolute this is a, joke. This is a female is so doctor shit. who is just telling another woman, this is just what to expect in life, suck it up, get on with it. No, you don't need... To change, she's already on HRT, but she's not been allowed to have the testosterone which she wants. Oh my god! Mm. Can you imagine how bad it must be if you are actually trans and you're dealing well, with your hormones, and then you've got G? Do you know what I mean? GP you feel don't like understand. That. Yeah. <laughs> oh god. And I mean, and as my friend pointed out, if this was a man that had a problem with his sex drive, he'd just be yeah, prescribed be Viagra. Popping Viagra and- out, yeah. No, not a problem. It'd be never even be a discussion about why do you need this? You just have to expect this. Just get on with life. Crikey. I think that might say more about the doctor's sex life than <laughs> your friends. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God we haven't identified this person. <laughs> <laughs> <All that. laughs> oh, no, that's pretty crap. I hope she's uh, your friend's able to get well, some l- support. Well, literally half an hour ago, I sent them an email with details of the lady that sorted me out. Your, with, d- your uh, dealer. H- my dealer? <laughs> I've now become an HRT dealer. <laughs> yes. Do you know what, Ebs? You are absolutely a menopausal influencer. I'm going to say right now, you have totally earned that badge. Yeah. Do you know, it just thank makes you. me think, like, thank God we're doing this, you know? Thank God we're just talking about it. And we're not particularly sort of political or, you know, I like to think of us as a, just sort of making it okay to talk about kind of vibe. But, you know, the more you delve into it, and the more experiences you hear, the angrier you get, don't you? You just get yeah. the thing. fucking joking. We were already pretty raging. We were, weren't we? Like... I know. <laughs> anyway. When my friend rang me, I was just got in, I was really exhausted. and But I thought, I just need to have a lie down and relax. But in the end, I ended up having a conversation with her and just ended up shouting down the phone going, this is ridiculous, this is so... Un- Why is there such health inequality? Oh. Why are men being treated so differently to women by the healthcare system, by female health professionals? Oh, yeah, I just went in a big old rage. But it makes you angry, doesn't it? It does. Yeah. We're doing the right thing, just talking about it, carrying on raising awareness, keep educating yourselves, 
sign whatever needs to be signed, you know, and you just got to say thank you to people like Diane Danzibrink, MP Carolyn Harris, mm. Kate Muir, who's going to be on in a couple of weeks' time. There were so many people that I could mention. I won't, off the, won't be able to off the top of my head now due to brain fog, obviously. Effing <laughs> <laughs> hormones. Chatting perimenopause in public. So what of it? Time now for the A to Z of Perry and Menno, where you get to hear us chat about different aspects of it all as we work our way through the alphabet. And this week, we have got to I. I, I? What you got for us, Terry? <laughs> <laughs> what an intro. Follow that, Terry. <laughs> no, I feel like I need to put an eye patch on or something. Sorry. <laughs> a horror. A horror. Oh, eye for irritability for me. Irritability. Oh, we all... Irritability. Yeah, we have touched on this a lot, yeah. I think. Well, we touched on anger, but I think it's a similar, similar deal, isn't it? But um, when you start losing estrogen, your hormones go all over the place. And it's pretty much what we had when we were kids, when we were girls, and we were starting to get loads of hormones and we had the same kind of irritability levels and, and not patient with anyone around us. And, and it's the same in reverse. Yeah. As you lose estrogen, you get the same issues with your emotions. And mm. actually, when I asked when I asked my partner, I said, do you think I, I was talking about doing I for irritability in this week's recording? I said, do you think I should do irritability? And I hadn't even finished the word. And she went, yes, definitely. And that's an emphatic <laughs> yes from me. So I think, uh, I, think I don't even oh, realise when I'm being irritable. So, um, yeah. But what I would say is that irritability for me, before I started HRT, my patience and everything was, was like a tightly coiled spring, ready to sort of like pounce mm. on anybody. And I actually, the more I've taken HRT and as it sort of got better into my system and I've calmed down on the kind of regime I'm on, I've started to feel a lot calmer and I think that irritability has started to really sort of like reduce as well. So yeah, I for irritability for me, but definitely noticing things like yoga as well that are helping and mindfulness and all the usual shizzle. But um, how, how are things uh, going on the progesterone it. side of things, Terry? Because I remember you mentioning a while back, actually, that you were struggling with the progesterone side of your HRT and that you're feeling irritable on that bit of it rather than on the estrogen yes. side. Yeah, and I changed that slightly. So I was taking a tablet and I was really, I really noticed when I was on it and I was taking it every night. But I changed the way I administer it. Uh, so I'll take it through the JJ now. Uh, it's a pessary uh, now. Oh. So, um, and I don't need as much of a dose of it. So I, I take less ah. of it. And um, ah. I know the difference between pessaries and suppositories and all, all those <laughs> things now. We really, really went into great detail about that in last uh, in the last episode, didn't we, everybody? Mm-hmm. Thanks for bearing with us, everyone. Absolutely. Lots of people seem to have issues which, with, with the holes, don't they? Which one does it go in? <laughs> it's just like, that's slightly, it's slightly worrying that, that women don't know what the difference is between them. Do you know, them. listen, I was reading something this week about this, right? And it's actually astonishing, like, how little people know about those bits, honestly. Anatomy. Yeah, yeah, honestly, and 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 actually, you know, what do you mean? Well, they they, do they, they don't not? know that there's like three holes, for example. They what? don't know this about the urethra. Yeah. Honestly, genuinely, I read some. It was a broadsheet article about it, saying people genuine, and it's all it's something like forty percent of women <laughs> don't know they've do, got do three th- holes. Yeah, do you think but we on, need to do a video not... version? <laughs> oh yeah, no. no, we're not going there. <laughs> but 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 listen, this actually. <sighs> basic biology in school would do right you know mm. not in my school would well, you know what no one ever told me that no. i'm like my sort of like um, oh. catholic upbringing i wasn't taught it no the thing is you use your body and you're using those three holes on a daily basis are you not or yeah you know, at least you know occasionally so why would you not know what you've got well, th- certainly two out of three i think there's a lot of rib- <laughs> on a daily basis <laughs> yes that's true yes. <laughs> sorry no, t- two out of three ain't bad. <laughs> two out of three ain't bad. No, but honestly, I think it's like repression and shame and, you know, lack of education and women not feeling empowered enough to sort of explore their bodies and understand exactly what's there. Honestly, it's a thing. It's a proper thing. Oh, that makes me sad. It is sad. a bit sad, isn't it? It's very sad, actually. It is sad. Yeah. Well, everyone, we have three holes. <laughs> women. Bina's got in a rocking chair. She's opened a storybook. <laughs> <laughs> Talk us through it, Bina. <laughs> Once upon a time. No, I'm joking. Uh, 
There you go. Do you know, this randomly sort of touches in a very weird way on my eye, my eye eye for the A to Z of Perry and Leno, oh, right? Eye eye. I, go on then, well, Because my eye harks back to old school ways of bringing up girls and women. And I think what we were just previously discussing there is to do with that as well, a sort of shame and, uh, shame and repression, you know. And I'm talking about imposter syndrome. Now, bear with me a little bit on this because I'm joining a few dots here. But the reason why I've linked it to perimenopause is because as I'm going through my perimenopause and we've talked in previous episodes about how it's the change in all areas of your life, you can almost see it as a rebirth, right? And one of the things that I've been determined on making sure that I don't do anymore is suffer from imposter syndrome. And I think that I've got a lot better at recognising it and understanding what it is. And I do link it back to my sort of 80s girlhood and how I was brought up and expected to behave as a girl when I was young Um, and that's no one's fault it's just conditioning it's just how the way things were you know things were very binary right and I grew up reading Enid Blyton books for example and the girls did particular things and the boys did particular things you know and so with my upbringing it was very much kind of like education 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 and I can remember my mum proudly saying throughout my whole life you're going to be a career woman because I kept coming home with all these fantastic report cards from school and my mum was like she had this very sort of catholic working class education gets you you know to move on and to move up and and to better yourself right and that's what I was brought up with it was also quite empowered and quite feminist as well and then I entered the world of work and what I realized was that I was academic but what I hadn't been taught how to do and what I didn't know how to do was to advocate for myself and promote myself in a way because in my mind that would have been seen as bragging and I directly Mm. link that back to my 80s girlhood okay and how I was brought up and expected to behave and there's something that's happened to me in this perimenopause experience through getting very very angry about health inequality but Mm. all these years before this working really hard and being a good girl right that I've just reached this point where not being able to advocate for myself in the workplace didn't propel me as far as I would have wanted to. I was one of those people that came in and I worked very, very hard and I expected to be recognised because I worked very hard. And I think a lot of women do that because of the way that have been brought up, because of the, the issues that I've been talking about. And with perimenopause, I just got to the point where I thought, you know what, I've had enough of this. I'm not going to do this anymore. I'm going to advocate for myself. I'm not going to suffer from imposter syndrome. I am really experienced and good at my job. And if good things come my way, I'm not going to think that I don't deserve them. I do bloody deserve them. I've worked hard all my life. And that's why I wanted to talk about imposter syndrome. Why do you think that's connected to perimenopause, though? Do you not think it's just the getting older and wiser? I think, so for, for, it, for me personally, the reason why it's linked to my perimenopause is because I've spent all these years not being listened to, not being heard, trying to express myself, trying to advocate for myself, finding that difficult because I wasn't listened to. And I think there's something that happened in my head that just went, is this it? Are you joking? You know, that I have been spending my life working really hard, educating myself, trying to be a good girl and this is what I get back. You know, when I do need some help, when I do need support, when I do need some understanding, it is simply not there because the culture isn't there for recognising my health issues. And something in me just snapped. I just thought, I'm angry, I'm not having this anymore. Well, that's good because I think you just, I don't know, you grow a sort of resilience. Yeah. The job I do at the moment, I, um, and this is a, this is also a male, female thing. I mean, I've often, I have met a few men who who have imposter syndrome. Oh, I don't doubt it. And I think yeah. that I think it does come from that sort of work hard, get recognised because that's what we're taught. We're taught it's meritocratic, and it's not. It's not always like that. But mm. I, the job I do at the moment, I have a recruitment type job, and I will receive CVs and emails from females, and they'll very quickly point out what they can't mm. do, even though they're like infinitely qualified to do a particular job. And I'll get blokes emailing who are nowhere near qualified and say things like, I think my experience speaks for itself. And it's just the way that women are constantly feeling apologetic about not being able to do something when actually they can do all these other things. And if, you know, yeah, I've never noticed it as starkly as I have in the last few months, Mm -hmm. particularly. Um, And it's been a bit of an awakening for me as well. This whole, you know, imposter syndrome, I think is, 
is a term that sort of you know uh, like a lot of these terms kind of came from it feels I feel like it came from America and suddenly everyone was talking about it but there's some real life experiences that I'm or real life examples that I'm now seeing in my day-to-day working life and it's quite astonishing really and actually I think you're right it does start at a very young age because a lot of females sort of entry level into the kind of jobs that I recruit so we're talking sort of 18 and over they're also very apologetic and they're not they've not even started yet you know they've not even Mm. quite started in life yet and there's some blokes who are just absolutely (laughs) not qualified or it's just just a different type of confidence Mm. and it's interesting yeah I would actually link it to what Terry said with her eye with irritability as well and in my head it's it is sort of linked because we get to that stage don't we where we have been apologizing all our fucking Mm. lives and in this middle-aged moment that we're in we've just had enough so we are fighting back a bit more we some of it does just come across as irritability and all of it just comes across as I've been apologising all my life. I'm going to stop giving two fucks and I'm going to say exactly what I think, actually. Mm -hmm. And you do feel a bit stronger and you do feel a bit of a fighter. And we've talked about this in previous episodes as well. It's about there are so many negative negative things to do with the menopause and perimenopause and to do with midlife. But actually, this is something, I think, to be celebrated as well. Do you know, when we recorded our first episode of Effing Hormones, right, that day, that same day, I was in town. I was in a lovely shop, lots of lovely house things, and I saw this postcard that said Frida Kahlo had her first art exhibition aged 47 and I spotted it and I thought oh. bingo and mm. that was it and I thought that was it and then we did effing hormones that yeah. night for the first time and I felt so good about it yeah I think I think I think you know there's a lot of emphasis put on youth as well and achievement so you have these you know 30 under 30 lists and all that nonsense and you're just like, can you just show me someone in their yeah. 40s who's... 47 up. 47, it? please. 47. <laughs> that'll, be, that'll do. <laughs> or like, you know, someone in their 60s who's yeah. done something, mate. Like, why do we... Not not knocking the youth, not, not knocking the young. We were all obviously young once and we were all very hungry and stormed in careers and all that kind of stuff. But I, I just think that there's so much emphasis on doing well young when actually it's, all, it's only now that I'm feeling confident to... Mm-hmm do things that I want to do and pursue things mm. that I want to pursue, but without feeling, oh, my God, I might fuck up mm. or what will everyone think? Yes, or totally. just worrying about, you know, what people might say. I mean, doing this, doing just doing this very podcast, it's not something I would have done even a year ago. I would really? never, I would not have done it. No, Something that Karen not. Arthur said a few episodes back, she was our finale for series one. Um, she said her friend had to say to her, no one starts out an expert because when she started her podcast she was worried that she she would get slated on social media for not knowing enough about everything and that was another thing that really helped me as well it was like no no one starts out an expert just come on and talk about your experiences yeah and i think you know we've met some amazing women so the ladies from gen m for example Mm. you know another example of women who've sort of at an age where they're sort of going sod this like this is what we're going to do do you know what i mean just like really Badass and I, I think all of this, all it. of this is a breakthrough of imposter syndrome. So yeah, I think it's yeah. definitely worthy of being in the A to Z of Perry and Mano. Definitely. I agree. Definitely. I wasn't convinced when you started, Helen. But, um, that was, that was <laughs> sold. brilliant. So that was a brilliant discussion. I'm Thanks. totally sold now. Excellent. Well, there you go. We've had a couple of eyes. Uh, Bina, what have you got for us in the II category? I'm going to start, this is going to sound a bit wishy-washy, but I'm going to say inclusive, being inclusive, because one thing, you know, that's sort of been apparent when we've been reading the reviews and the emails we've been getting and also talking to our own family and friends about it is, is actually, we're all going through various things, but if you include those in your life, in what's happening, talking to people, talking to your partners, talking to your kids about it and including them in what's going on, I think actually it can kind of help everyone help you help your families understand what's going on with you so talking about the irritability talking about the hot flushes talking about you know whatever it is you're going through because i I guess just because of previous generations people just cracked on no one really talked about it It wasn't really discussed unless you were from kind of you know a quite progressive household or whatever like i mean my mum my mum was very open about it we saw what was going on with my mum but i think you know a lot of people when i do speak to lots of friends their mum's didn't talk about it so I think actually being inclusive of people in your lives about what is going on 
might kind of help everyone. I had a conversation with my brother the other day about, and he was like, yes, I know that women have been given antidepressants now. And they, that, and, that, and I was like, brilliant. I was like, I would never yeah. have thought I'd have that conversation with my brother. Seriously. Yeah. I'm like, and now he knows. Yeah. I'm so chuffed about that. No, it's great. And I had a a phone call a couple of weeks ago and it was someone that had heard me talking on the radio about this podcast and about all the issues that we discuss in this podcast. And she's in her 30s and she said, no, just thank you so much because I feel like I now know what to expect. And I know so much more about the menopause now. And my mother never taught me about it. But actually now there's these discussions are so much more wide based. Mm that I'm starting to know. And I said, this is, it's so important, isn't it? Because to be forewarned is forearmed. So hopefully the generation behind us will know loads more about the menopause and what to expect than we ever did because it just hit us like a bloody brick wall, didn't it? And we didn't know what to expect. Go on, Terry. I think that inclusivity as well, I think it's about breaking down the shame, as like you've been saying, but Mm. I... I had a few friends around in the garden recently and it was cold but we were outside and had a drink and there was some guys there and I told them about the podcast and what we're doing and then a bit of me was cringing like oh they're not going to want to hear this conversation but they were really kind of really gracious about it and then I thought why am I embarrassed about talking about something that happens to half the population and will have affected their mums their wives their their daughters mm-hmm. you know why am I embarrassed about it and I realized it's mm-hmm. on me that and that I have to include yeah. men as well in that conversation so I think for me that inclusivity means being aware of talking about it as well and not just making it about bravo women bravo yes yeah. yes. Yes. Yeah. yes fantastic so that's my eye that's my eye aye aye all those in favour say aye aye aye, aye. 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 <laughs> I think the motion has been carried <laughs> <That's good>. not passed <laughs> <laughs> oh dear Where's Jackie Weaver when you need her? I know. <laughs> does anyone remember? Will anyone even remember who Jackie Weaver is if I say that now? Yeah, <laughs> no. she does pop up occasionally on things, doesn't she? She, she does, she does talks old, now, like, doesn't she? Yeah, TV panel thing. Yeah, she does. Yeah. Time now for you to hear from our guest for this episode, Jem Brooks. Jem is a personal trainer who works specifically with women to train in sync with their menstrual cycle. Why is that important? I'm glad you asked, because you are going to find out. Uh, And you'll also find out why it's hugely important for the way you exercise when you're in perimenopause and menopause too. Well, Jem got into all of this after experiencing her own difficulties after childbirth and with certain types of contraception, which had a big impact on her mental state as well. Those experiences got her interested in working with women in midlife, around their cycle, and in perimenopause and beyond. She's got some great tips for you, especially if you're feeling like you want to regain your spark. Well, don't we all? Welcome, Gem, to Effin Hormones. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Emma. What a gorgeous introduction. Ah, well, you deserve it. Now, tell us how you got into this then, because this this sounds like, I mean, there's a million and one personal trainers out there, aren't there? But what you're doing sounds really, really, to me, unique and, and different, right? Yeah, and it all comes from my own personal experience. So, as you said, about five years ago, not long after I'd had my son, he was about two, and I'd been back on contraception, and... Like most women, I think we tend to spend a lot of our 20s on contraception. Then our 30s when we actually try and come off it because we might want to try and conceive. And then our 40s trying to figure out what the hell is going on. Mm. So not long after I had my son, I went back on a new type of contraception. And I was on it for about two years. And year two, things just starting to go AWOL. Emotionally, I was all over the place. And it got to the point where my husband said, you, you need to do something about this. I actually left the house. I didn't know if I was going to come back. I left the house, Ish. left my husband and my kids and just took my car keys. And it happened a few times. So after that, I thought I need to know if, if I need some extra help. And I need to understand what's going on with my hormones. Because basically I've spent most of my life putting synthetic hormones in my body. And I don't know what that's doing to me. And it was the best decision that I made. And five years ago, until now, I track my cycle. I feel like I have a really good understanding of my hormone health. But because of that, it's naturally led me to explore more about it from a personal training level. 
because yeah. at college we were not taught that women are different to men. When I went back to college to train as a personal trainer, we trained them the same. So I went and thought, surely this isn't right. And lo and behold, there was an amazing lady doing some great work out there. I bought her book, subsequently went on a course, and, and that's my journey. So just go back to the bit when you left the home and you were clearly, you know, having real problems with your mental health. Yeah. Were you certain that that was hormones then? Was it fairly obvious to you that that was the problem and it was connected to the contraception? Yeah, yeah I'd been on the cusp of postnatal depression and I had been on some low level of medication to help me with anxiety, which I was struggling with. And... I knew because there was a pattern, there was a rhythm, but it was happening regularly, but regularly over a period of time. So on the third time it happened, I just felt it. I intuitively felt that there was something out of kilter. And the only other thing that was going on in my body at that point was hormones and my contraception that I was on. I'd come off the medication at this point as well. And did you go to your GP and I try went and to my sort GP, it that one? Yeah, and she was amazing. I'd actually had problems with this contraception initially, but I stuck at it. And I just said, I, I, I want to come off. And they were really supportive. And it was a little bit of a rigmarole for me to do it. But we got there in the end. It's really interesting because it's the same sort of stuff we're talking about menopause. Like hormones are responsible for so much at so many yeah. different stages of our lives, aren't they? Yeah. They just they throw everything into kilter. Can I just say I'm really, really pleased that you got good support from your GPs around that time because I also have really, really struggled with contraception down the years and I've never actually been able to, to take it because, it, it, I, honestly, I lose my mind. I, I, I do. And if you're like that, I don't know, the perception that I get from the medical establishment are like, no, it's not that. It's not that. Everybody can take the pill. But I'm like, no, but I can't I can't do you know what I mean there's this real weight of expectation that this is just what everybody does yeah and there's so many out there and you know as I'm going to tell you you are unique your experience of your menstrual cycle your hormones your your body is a fine-tuned amazing specimen unique to you so there's not a one size that you know it takes time to find the right balance so once you came off that that contraception were things a lot better for you for you mentally then you found that it was a lot easier yeah things started to settle Mm. down and then I started to become curious about my cycle and how I was feeling emotionally energetically started to notice different ways that I wanted to exercise and it just naturally then organically happened that things started to make sense I think I just took it step by step and made a conscious effort to start to get to know my body now and start to take responsibility for it. As a working mum, I tended to put my children's needs before mine and I realised that keeping myself healthy was really important to keep them healthy and to be able to look after them. And that's how I started to then get to know my cycle more. It's funny, isn't it? When I, I mean... To me now, periods are a bit of a distant memory, but even when I had them, I was crap at being a woman. And by that, I mean, I never knew when they were coming and it was always like a shock to me, really. But from everything you've got, I mean, they are so important in terms of how we feel and how we operate and in terms of where we are in our cycle. So tell us what, what you found out then through, through doing your training. So first of all, my energy levels. So I really started to notice how my energy levels were at various phases, really amazing. And I wanted to be really out there. And other times I wanted to withdraw. I was very into running at the time. And I couldn't understand why one week I'd go out and smash a run. Two weeks later, I'd be like nowhere near it. I'd be huffing and puffing and like when I was warming up. So that's when I started to realise there was something in this. So I started to tweak my own training naturally before I started to find the research about it. And then with my food, and I've always noticed that my body temperature was slightly elevated around my cycle, but never noticed the pattern. Joints, I've had an issue with my back that would flare up around my premenstrual phase. It would get really niggly. My pelvic floor, I thought I had a really bad pelvic floor after my children. After numerous sessions with a specialist, it turns out I don't. I actually have urge incontinence, which means that basically when I need a wee, 
literally, I've, as soon as I'll open that toilet door, I've got to go, like, and I can't hold it. It's like a brain and a bladder connection, which I've worked on and it's a lot better, but it happens at certain phases in my cycle. Like, it's happening now. I know it happens now because I'm five days off my period. So there I am, Gem needs a wee, get me to a toilet now. <laughs> and I've got it, you know, but I'm okay with that. And I still work on it and I've got better control now. But so all these things started to form this big picture of, you know, this rhythm, this really cool rhythm that would go and then it would happen again and again. And what difference has it made to your life then understanding this cycle and, and how it affects you mentally and physically? Yeah, so from a training perspective, I train totally differently now. I train around my own cycle, which is shorter than when I started doing this. So I train in that kind of flow with very high intense sessions and then I taper it off. I have a lot of mobility in there, strength training, and I do bits of cardio for fun, but I train hard or I train super easy, and I don't train in this grey area in the middle. So when are you supposed to do this hard training? Which part of your cycle? So if you imagine, let's say, we'll take a typical cycle that they say is 28 days, which actually it's not. The average woman has a cycle between 30 and 40 days, so it's rubbish. Oh. I had a surprise this morning, and I've just been counting on my calendar, and it's 48 days. Oh, wow. my gosh. Yeah, it's yeah. all over the shop. They yeah. will be all over the shop being a Perry. So, I, yeah. uh, so, so I, I have no idea what, like, I have no idea. But mm. when you then start to understand your symptoms a little bit more, know how you feel, you'll have more of an idea potentially when it might be coming. Mm. Because you'll yes, know yeah. certain um, things that will happen as your hormones drop off just before you're due to bleed. So if you want to stay fit and healthy, are there certain points in your cycle where you should be hammering it and other points when you shouldn't? How does it work? Yeah, so it's really different for everybody and I don't want to use the word hammering it um, <laughs> because I don't want everybody to think that you've got to hammer it. But as women in our 40s, strength training is the best way to start to build lean muscle mass because we know that as our hormones start to, estrogen and progesterone start to taper off. However, in peri, they go AWOL and they go really high it's harder for us to maintain and build muscle mass. We need resistance for the body. And strength training, if you've never done it before, doesn't mean going up to a squat rack and being like, I've got to be Mrs. Muscle. It start <laughs> at body weight, you know? You start at body weight, you nail the form, and then you build it up. Okay, and but different exercises at different times of your cycle. Is there some part, of, some days where you should just be like, absolutely not, I'm not doing any exercise at this point? If you're going to take a typical month, let's just say an average 28 day cycle, let's just keep it really simple and break our cycle into two halves. Yeah. So we've got our period day one and then we've got ovulation. We'll say it's day 14 bang in the middle. Yeah. So from day one to day 14, that is when you want to start to be increasing the intensity of your load. Now, for some women, day one is horrific because you are really heavily bleeding. So you might start lifting it up day four and retraining mm. then starting to build your weights back in and then as you get closer to ovulation that's when you want to be doing your high intense stuff hitting your pbs so when you're doing plyometric work that's when you're lifting heavy doing low reps and then you have a you've got a little bit of a window after you've ovulated as well when you can really still go for it if you're feeling like you can and then you start tapering it down so then you'd be doing more restorative stuff as you kind of move into that luteal phase, we call it. And then as you start to get that feeling where you want to withdraw, like just before your period, really focusing on mobility, stretching, Pilates, yoga. Now, that is a typical average scenario. And that's mm. not the right thing for every woman based on her individual needs and how she's feeling. If I've got a woman who's really fatigued, I'm not going to be slamming her completely as hard in that follicular phase because actually what we have to look at is lifestyle factors and stress. So when you are, when you're not having your periods anymore and you don't have a cycle in the same way, what do you do? This is the most beautiful question. I love this one. So This is me because I haven't had a period for right. two years. So yeah, how do, what, what is my cycle? <laughs> for me... I like to say to women that you follow the moon cycle. So the moon generally has around about a 20, 28 to a 32 day cycle. And the moon actually mirrors our own menstrual cycle. 
with the mm. seasons and there's lots of similarities so if you're someone that likes that analogy then the moon really gives you the opportunity to kind of have that time in a new moon where you can't see it in the sky where you really retreat and withdraw like you bleed and then you mm -hmm. go to the midpoint when it's a full moon and you're ovulating and you want everybody to see you where you might dial it up so i either work with women mm. and we use that analogy or we tend to work on a three-week periodization plan for a woman who's not not having periods as well what do you think of that ems that's nice isn't it i'm interested in it is it a psychological thing or is it actually does it actually work because our bodies are about 70 percent water aren't they so and they the are moon does affect yeah. water. so that's a bit of both for me so that's me because i i follow the moon cycles that's a big part of how i live my life as well so that feels like a very natural transition for me but the science side is much more about like, you know, you do it on a three week periodization, which is just a little bit shorter than the moon cycle. So, again, it depends on what type of woman you are. Well, do you know what's interesting, actually? There are some religions and some faiths that, that actually follow the lunar calendar. Now you're saying this, I'm wondering if actually there's some sort of weird ancient wisdom in it. Oh, there will be. I mean, there's tribes where women are actually allowed to go and basically just hide while they're on their period and just rest and restore. I mean, how amazing if we were given that in society. I love the moon analogy. I love That's that. That's really good. And as for those women, I was worried that that was actually women being put in their place and being told to get away because they were dirty and unclean having their period. But actually, if it's seen as being an empowering thing, then that's OK. I think that what's happened over the years in, you know, I'm, I was brought up a Hindu is that what I've been told by my very feminist dad, <laughs> which is brilliant, um, is that actually when when all this came about, it, it was meant to be go and go and rest and restore. And and over year over many years, culturally, it's somehow become this whole stay away from the temple, you're unclean. Mm. But actually it's about yeah, you you know, because we're meant to reproduce, aren't we? And we're meant to be fit and, you know, in times before medicine, modern medicine, I guess. You had to protect your eggs, I guess. Mm. And mm. so, yeah, there's, there's definitely something in that. It's really interesting, that. Let's go back to something you talked to at the beginning, Gem, and that was that um, you were inspired to go down this path by someone that uh, you trained with. And I think that's Dr. Stacey Sims. Is that right? Can you tell us a bit about her? Yeah, so Dr. Stacey Sims is based in New Zealand and... When I basically typed into Google training and exercising around your period, she was the only, pretty much the only person that came up and resources. So I looked into her and she is a exercise psychologist and a nutritional scientist. She is awesome because she is a trailblazer in my profession, leading the way and putting a spotlight on the science for women and why we have been marginalised for decades. There's not been any research or information for women because we've been treated as men. And her strapline that is absolutely freaking awesome is women are not small men. And we are not. <laughs> and we are not. <laughs> No, she is awesome. That's I brilliant. took some time out earlier today to watch her TED Talk, actually, and I recommend anyone would do the same. And it's incredible. So she's like this incredible nutritionist and academic. She's doing research at Stanford. And the, the other people are going, why are you researching women and training and nutrition? They're the same as men. I was like, no, they're not the same as men. That's yeah. the whole point. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So she's doing cool things for my industry. Can I just ask about the women that you work with? You know, particularly like perimenopausal women, when they first come to you, what kind of state are they in and what kind of knowledge do they have about all of this before they come to see you? So they generally don't have a good awareness of what perimenopause is or what menopause is, as mm. I didn't until I started researching it. They are typically quite stressed. They are tired, lethargic. They this sounds familiar. <laughs> yeah. Yep. They God. feel like they're a moody bitch. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they um, feel like they've hit a wall with their training, so they might not be seeing the results that they're used to. Um, and actually, they're quite stressed. Mm. Do you see women who have never trained before that come to you because they yes. want to? Right. Yes. Mm. So actually, this is potentially a whole 
new lease of life for women at this time of life. Because I, I, just from my own experience, I I can go through years for phases of years and years and years of not exercising and not caring about it. I went to the gym at some point in my 30s and used to build muscle quite quickly and get fit quite quickly. But it's only really through going through perimenopause and, well, I don't know if I am going through perimenopause, but certainly I have this histamine intolerance, which often flares up at perimenopause. It really is only through doing yoga that yoga heals me. I know that it heals me. And so it's really through this midlife experience that I have become really interested in actually getting strong and fit, it really for the first time in my life. Is this sounding familiar to you as well then, Terry? I want to feel it without having to put the groundwork in. <laughs> how, 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 how would you... Everybody wants, everyone wants that. <laughs> Yeah, I know. Uh, it's yeah. not an, it's not I, an Amazon purchase. <laughs> no, I know. Unfortunately, I know. I do keep him in business, to be honest, the Amazon man. Um, what what can we do if if I absolutely detest gyms? I've probably been about I could probably count on one hand how many times I've been to a gym. I don't like that feeling of walking into a gym or having to get the the right kit or any of that. I always feel really really intimidated doing any kind of sport in that sense. What can women do who firstly who don't have gym memberships or don't have the right PE kit. What can people like me do to to exercise at home or in other ways in the local park without anyone seeing us? <laughs> <laughs> yes, and Terry, first of all, you are not alone in feeling like that. So pretty much most of the women I work with feel like that. I'm scared to go into a gym, don't know where to start. Then if they've been into one, feel a bit lost or intimidated. So again, culturally, that's not cool that we should feel like that. You need to work with me, first of all, and then I can help you. (laughs) Um, But you can do things from home. So if you think, if you've never strength trained before, you start with body weight, then you buy some nice little kettlebells. You could buy some dumbbells. What does body weight mean? You work with using the resistance from your body. So you do body weight squats. You'd go on the floor. We can start building the strength, the upper body strength or lunges. It's all about movement patterns and looking at form with strength training. And then we start to add the load. So once you've got the foundations, you add the load. And if you've got not got a budget and you don't want to spend a lot of money, fill a rucksack with them um, books. I mean, you lift, everybody in fitness was doing that in lockdown, but start lifting bottles for weights and overhead stuff. So there's lots of improvisation that women can do. It doesn't have to be expensive and you can do it in your home. I've heard of people using tins of baked beans, so you could yeah. do that, Terry. Yeah. Yeah, well... Well, yeah. that's exactly what I teach, Terry. That's exactly what I teach. I have an academy that is remote that women come on a 12-week programme for me and I teach them how to strength train so they exercise and they get all the educational bits and they get me for 12 weeks to support them and it works. And is this the sort of stuff that helps with, you know, because as as we go into perimenopause and menopause that you know our serotonin fluctuates and i know that exercise can release all sorts of positive what's the i don't know what the right terminology is endorphins you know endorphins that's the one and also you know you've got um issues around um osteoporosis is that something that that strength training can sort of address a hundred percent so strength training but the other one that i also mentioned earlier is plyometric training so plyo stuff you're bounding so anything kind of like jump focused which can feel a little bit um, scary if you've got maybe a weak pelvic floor but there are ways that you can do it and you start off jumping multi-directional plane movement where we want to put stress on the bone in multi-directionals to increase the bone density so what do you mean by that so like bounding like lateral laterally so side to side those kind of movements diagonally so again that all comes once you've got good technique, you're landing safely. And Gem, do you find that women in middle age and going through what we're all going through find it harder to get fit and harder to get that muscle tone? Because, you know, it is easy to lose weight and be fitter when you're young, isn't it? You know, part of it is middle age spread, part of it is all this hormone stuff we've been talking about. Yeah. But it's harder, right? Emma, it's 100% scientifically proven as women, it is harder for us to build muscle mass and to lose fat then as we age because of our diminishing hormones. Oh, That's bloody perimenopause, man. Yeah. <laughs> Fills me with a lot of joy. But the, <laughs> you can do things about it, so it doesn't all have to feel gloom and doom. And that is very much the spotlight that I like to share with women to educate them so they feel equipped that they can do things, so they can make better food choices, so they can reduce their stress levels because... 
it's not just exercise they've got to look at everything because mm. if you're exercising but you're not eating appropriately you're not fueling in and around your training if you're not getting your protein you're not sending the messages to your brain for muscle synthesis to happen after a workout which is more detrimental so there's so much to it that it can, you can't just think about exercise Give us a quick guide to protein, Jen, because this is really, really important, isn't it? Particularly for yeah. us at this time of life. Yeah. So protein is really important because it's the main macronutrient. It's the building block for our muscles. And as we mature, we need more protein. OK, so as a rule of thumb, and it's different for everybody if we were talking about weight, muscle mass. But as a rule of thumb, in your 30s, late 30s, early 40s, you're looking at 30 grams of protein post-workout, okay? Mm. Then, and Emma, this is going to hit you, when you've then gone through menopause, you're not having periods, you're looking at 40 grams of protein after a workout. Mm. And you want to have that protein within a certain time window as well, roughly between 30 to 45 minutes to really garner the benefits. We want protein that has something called leucine in, which then triggers this messaging from the brain and sends it to the muscles within this time window. But again, that's if you are doing strenuous exercise. So you know the exercise that we talked in that earlier phase of the cycle, when you're dialing it down a little bit and you're not damaging your muscles as much, tearing them as much, then you won't need the same amount of protein if you're doing like a yoga session or a gentle Pilates session. So, but every meal, I recommend all my clients, every meal, you should have protein in every meal. Um, 30 grams of protein, if you don't know what it looks like, it is, it's a chicken breast, it's a can of tuna, it's a salmon mm -hmm. fillet, it is five eggs. Woo, five eggs? Five wow. eggs, yeah. What about, what if you veggie, Jim? So veggie, things like lentils are amazing, tofu, kidney beans, chickpeas, Black beans, so lots of kind of like beans and lentils are great. And they're also a really good way for meat eaters to top up that protein as well. Oh, a nice dog. Give Perry Ooh. Trump's a whole new uh, lease of life. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, here we go again. <laughs> Gem, are you ready for your Perry Perry grilling? I'm ready. <laughs> oh, I hope, I hope you've been instructed. So a reminder of Perry Trump's. You can go and see the scoreboard at the Perry Trump's, web, Perry Trump's website. That's a whole other thing. I mean, I think we should create <laughs> maybe, one. Yeah, maybe Perry Trump should have its own website. Maybe Perry Trump should have its own podcast. Yeah. Just, oh, no. no. <laughs> Terry won't be joining. Oh, no, 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 no. no. Uh, no, it's at the Effin Hormones website, effinhormones.com. Uh, go to the features and you'll see all the scores there. Tot your scores up, let us know what you think and then come on the leaderboard of doom. Oh, my goodness me. <laughs> so, Gem, you had a look at all the many, many, many symptoms, did you? Yes. Um, what were some of the... Did you have any of the rare ones that were on there, sort of burning mouth syndrome or no, anything no, wacky? It, no, the, the latest one that I've had is um, random itchy skin. Oh, yeah. yeah, I have that. It's a nightmare, isn't it? Yeah. So what was your total score then, Jen? What did you come in at? It was 42. Oh, OK. Yeah, OK. I think yeah, that's yeah. fairly low comparatively yeah. compared to some poor buggers out there. Yeah. <laughs> the highest score, Jen, was 125. Oh. So you're doing all right, I think. I, am, I know I'm doing all right. Mm. Yeah, yeah, she's putting all this work in. Yeah, I know. <laughs> like, yeah. yeah. Wonderful. Right, uh, time now for you to choose a song for our Spotify playlist. So the rules for this are quite simple. So it could be a song that gets you out of bed when you don't feel like it. Maybe it's a particular point in your cycle. Or a song that makes you feel like a badass woman or something to soothe you or something to express your rage. What are you going to go for, Gem? So I have chosen a song and... I actually am not very good at remembering the lyrics of songs and I tend to make up my own words. So <laughs> I apologise now if this song doesn't actually mean what I think Exist. it means. But yeah, um, it exists, but it's, um, it's by Seagrid and it's Mirror. And she is a fully, well, she's an energetic, gorgeous Swedish woman. And she just, yeah, it's a really nice song. She's okay. a star. She's been a star since she was about 12. I think she was a child star, wasn't she? Yeah. Didn't she win Sweden's Got Talent or something? Oh, anyway. did she? 
I digress. Yeah, I think so. Oh, she's rubbish now. I saw her. Oh. I saw her and I thought she was fairly new in Manchester. And now I'm gutted. <laughs> I love a bit of Sigrid. Did you think she was all sort of underground and like, you know? She was all edgy and I was a bit old and untrendy and I was like, she's so cool. Look at the way she moves. (laughs) She is. Well, listen, if she's upbeat, she's very welcome on the the Spotify playlist because I've been moaning there's been too much like uh, rock music on here. So if it's if it's upbeat and dancey, then I'm I'm happy. Yeah. (laughs) Well, I hope so. I feel I feel the pressure now. No, 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 come and join me. Come and join me in my little corner where I'm like, we need more dance music. Well, (laughs) or you can join in your corner. Oh, yeah, no, I'm definitely with Helen in the dance corner for sure. (laughs) You can can, can like both. Big fish, little fish, sail away, sail away, sail away. (laughs) God. God, I'll I'll get my coat. Anyway, it's time for us to get our sparklies on and go to the Effins. Uh, this is where you get to nominate an awesome person who's uh, got you through those tough times, maybe a friend, could be someone in uh, the public eye, um, but just someone that you want to give a bit of uh, a shout-out to and a big old Effin. Who are you going to go for? It's got to be Dr Stacey Sims. Oh. Yay! She's shining a light on the future for women and exercise. So for me, mm. she is just awesome. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I, I, I couldn't believe it when I saw that TED talk. I was like, oh, my God, how have I never realised this before? This woman is absolutely incredible. And I love how she's expressing it as well. Yeah, she's just cool, isn't she? Yeah, she's, she's cool. really cool. Yeah. And so are you, Gem. Hooray. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I think it's time for a big round of applause for Gem. Thank you Yay. very much. Aww. Thank you, Gem. Thank you. Thank you. Really informative. That was so interesting and taking out so much useful information from that, Gem. Thank you so much. Where can people find you? So you can check out my website at gembrooks.co.uk and you can download some cool free guides and some workouts and sign up to my mailing list for updates. Or if you're a bit more of a social person, check me out on Instagram at gem underscore underscore brooks underscore pt. And just point out how you spell it because it might not be obvious to people. Oh yeah, it's not obvious. It's Gemma with a J and Brooks without an E. And I'll blame that on my mother. <laughs> and your husband. And my husband. Oh, yeah, I forgot about him. Oh, yeah. Shout out. Shout out. <laughs> Brooks okay. gets a shout out. <laughs> oh, thanks, Jem. Well, that's it for this episode of Effing Hormones. Hey, and if you do decide to take up some exercise, why not let us know what you're up to? It's always nice to boast a bit, isn't it? Come on, share with us. And you can do that at the Effin Hormones Facebook group. Just search for Effin Hormones Podcast on Facebook and we should come up. Don't forget that is Effin with no G. Thank you so much for listening. And just a reminder that if you click follow on your podcast platform, then we should just pop up whenever there's a new episode. And if you write a review for us on Apple Podcasts or share what you think of Effin Hormones on social media, then more people will find us and we will love you forever. A big thank you if you have already done that. Uh, There's also a chance for you to rate us now if you listen on Spotify. This is amazing news, Justin. Uh, Just make sure you update your app so it gives you the option to do it. Right, I'm off to update my Spotify app. Thank you.